to resume Sunday school gatherings. And with that in mind, there will be a Sunday school teachers and assistants meeting next Wednesday. And uh, we'll send an email out shortly giving you more detail concerning that meeting. Well, I'd like to turn this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We shall be looking at these first five verses. I'll read verse 2 because really this is the, uh, the focal point, the apex of these five verses. Paul is speaking about the character of his preaching and he says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the subject before us in these verses could be a question. What makes a good preacher? What is it that we look for, that we expect? People today so often speak, sometimes I think thoughtlessly, and they say, oh, that was a great sermon. Or he's a powerful preacher. And it may be that they are saying that for all the right reasons. But sometimes people make statements like that, and they're really referring to the preacher's eloquence, or his powers of oratory, or the fact that he engages the attention through the use of sound bites and anecdotes. But what is it that Paul defines as true preaching, good preaching? Well, here in these first five verses, there are three, we could say four, elements that Paul identifies, he's speaking of course about himself, which are traits of good preaching. And perhaps amongst us here, there will be, in days to come, those who go into the ministry, some of the young men. But what should they aspire to? Who should be their model for ministry? If this church or any other church in the future has to call a pastor, then what should be looked for, at least as far as the ministry, the preaching of that man goes? Well, we live in an age of slogans, catchphrases. Some would say in an age where people's concentration span is diminished. Television and the ease with which television captures our attention means that when it comes to preaching, a man simply speaking with no visual aids, by and large, it's very difficult to keep the person's attention. And so often Christians are attracted to engaging speakers. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but there may be. Has it not always been the case? Well, if you read some of the phrases here, it would seem that the Apostle Paul was very mindful that there were those perhaps even at Corinth who were attracted to those who spoke with excellency of speech. That means uh, re rhetorical display in verse 1. And verse 4 speaks of those who, or Paul says he didn't speak with enticing words of men's wisdom. And the word enticing here, or enticing words, it was used to describe a man who was a powerful debater. The way he brought all his arguments together and with uh, clever trickery, really, he brought you round to his way of thinking and his view of the arguments in a law court. And then, it was used to describe a salesman. There are salesmen today, and perhaps we've all met them, and we can say, well, that particular salesman, he could talk the hind leg off a donkey. And that's the idea here. Someone who can speak with such power of word that uh, you're, you're gathered in, you're, you're brought in to be convinced by what he's saying. But Paul says, I didn't use 
such strategies in order to preach? Well, here we need to ask ourselves the question then, what defined Paul's preaching? Because surely Paul is set before us as a blueprint, a model. He says, be ye followers or imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. He wrote to Timothy and would say, you have fully known my purpose, my policy, the way I conducted myself, how I approached preaching, evangelistic work and ministry. And Paul is very conscious here to, of himself, not himself personally, but himself as that model preacher. So look at verse 1, first of all. He says, and I, brethren, when I came to you. He's contrasting himself with some of the other famous preachers that others seem to follow. Some of them were mere philosophers. But Paul says, when I came, I came with a particular pattern and policy. Then in verse 4, he says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. So what is it then? There are four, you can say three, you can say four. I say that because the last two are closely linked. But let's think here of these four characteristics of Paul as a model preacher. And firstly, Paul as a preacher was a man who was conscious of his inadequacies. Is that what makes a good preacher? Well, we perhaps wouldn't be first drawn to someone who comes across conscious of their inadequacies. But Paul was. Verse 3, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He knew something of his limitations, something of the greatness of the work that he was called to engage in. He was not a man of great self-confidence. Confident in the message, yes. Confident that he came to bring the truth of God, yes. But he was not confident in his own abilities. Not confident in himself as a man, as a personality. In fact, when you read some of the phrases elsewhere in the book of these two letters to the Corinthians in particularly, but also the Galatians, some would suggest that Paul wasn't a particularly uh, attractive man. He says, I was base in my presence among you. He wasn't a, a man with a great charisma, naturally speaking, it would seem. And he says, I was here with weakness and much trembling. One thing you could never say of Paul was that when he preached, he preached with a human swagger. Yet there are some today. I remember some years ago, there was a particular preacher, and uh, not too far from here, actually. And uh, when he visited a certain church, he would parade up and down the pulpit. And whilst you could say there's nothing wrong with that, at the same time, it came across as if he had a natural self-confidence and swagger. Well, Paul wasn't like that. He says, I was with you in weakness. Perhaps it was because of his travels. He was weary, a physical weakness. Perhaps it was as a result of being stoned, being abused being hounded from one town to another in fear of imprisonment or worse. And he came to the Corinthians in weakness. One thing you could say about Paul's preaching is he was never going to persuade someone by his natural presence. He didn't have that, and he didn't rely upon that, and nor should any preacher. He says, with trembling, and fear. If we go back to Acts chapter 18 and verses eight, uh, 9 and 10, you'll see that part of this fear seems to be a natural fear. 
And so the Lord reassures him. Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. But Paul, though he was confident in God, he had a natural timidity to him. Perhaps he saw the wickedness of the Corinthians. He knew some of them uh, lived lives which were debauched and immoral. And he would, by his very preaching, expose the sinfulness of their lives. And there was that natural fear about him. But others point out that this fear was more than that. There was, with the apostle, a sense of the great calling that he had. He is called here to preach the gospel. He would say elsewhere, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He would say to the, in 2 Corinthians, to the one we are a savor of death unto death, and to others a savor of life unto life. He had a consciousness that the power of the gospel that he preached was a gospel that would contribute to condemnation and judgment in some, but life in others. He had a charge laid upon him, and it was not up to him whether he preached or not. He had a compulsion laid upon him, and so this fear was in part a fear with a sense of the importance of his calling and his preaching ministry. That's what we seek, surely, in any preacher. Not someone that comes casually and they can turn on and turn off like a tap, whether they preach or not, but someone who has laid upon them a sense of divine mandate and obligation. Someone who is accountable to God for the fact they have to preach, but accountable to God for what they preach. Secondly, we see in these verses that a good preacher or good preaching is to preach Christ. Paul was a man determined. He says, I determined, I purposed not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he's telling us that in contrast to what he has already said in verse 1. He's not going to appeal to emotional, he's not going to resort to rational and emotional appeals to move the minds and the emotions of his hearers. He is simply going to preach Christ and Christ crucified. That will be what he says. He's not going to be uh, moved, as some seem to be moved today, to say, well, I've got to accommodate the message to my society. I've got to make it relevant. I've got to tone down some of the, 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 the sharp and uh, offensive characteristics of the gospel. No, says Paul, I will simply preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. You could summarize that phrase like this. Jesus Christ, the person of the Savior, him crucified, the work of the Savior. The person and work. Jesus Christ, it speaks of his deity. Paul would not hold back and, and, and suggest anything other than Jesus who appeared in the flesh, was the eternal Son of God, with power to judge the hearts of men, who will one day return in the clouds with great glory and summon before him the whole race of mankind. This is what Paul would preach. Jesus Christ, his Messiahship, the fact he is anointed of God, that he has the authority of a king, that his teaching has the authority of heaven. We do not, as some do today, say, well, of course, Christ was a child of his own era. 
He didn't understand science in the way that modern scientists do. He would speak as if the world was created in six days because that's what everybody thought in his day. But now we know better. Paul would have nothing of such thought and logic. He would present Christ as omniscient, as knowing all things, as pre presenting himself as the inspired teacher of truth in all its detail. And he would speak of Christ as the all-sufficient high priest and saviour by whom alone we may have access to God. That would be offensive to many of the Corinthians. That's what offended so many in Ephesus who were wed to the goddess Diana because to present Jesus Christ and him crucified as the only way whereby we may approach the one true God would discount all other priests and present Christ as the all-sufficient mediator. Him crucified, it speaks of his redemptive work. There's no appeal here, really, to the carnal mind. A crucified saviour is an offence the Jew and the Greek, that's what we looked at in the previous chapter. The cross declares the holiness of God, the sinfulness of sin. Paul cannot preach Christ crucified without explaining why. The Son of God had to come, had to become man. It was because sin is such a sinful thing. That is because all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Holiness, morality, judgment. No, there's no making these things more palatable. If a preacher is a good preacher, he will declare sin in all its ugliness, in all its power to condemn. We hear today, of some who are gaining popularity even in evangelical circles who suggest that homosexuality is not the sin, the great sin that Scripture declares it to be. You can be same-sex attracted, so they say, but so long as you don't indulge in homosexual behavior, you can be a Christian. But that's a misnomer. Because if you are attracted, you are lusting after another person. And the whole thing is discredited. Why do they promote these things? Well, it's to accommodate the Christian message to a modern era where these things are increasingly being forced upon us as normal behavior, a normal practice, normal thinking. But Paul would never do that if he preached Christ crucified because the gospel of Christ crucified pulls sinners away from their sin. It calls them to turn their back upon the world and to seek entrance to the kingdom of God through repentance, a changed life, a new attitude to sin, and so on and so forth. And this contrasts this preaching of Christ with so many different styles of preaching that find their way into the churches today. I'll just mention one or two. The health and wealth gospel. Paul would never preach such a thing. That's mere enticing words of men's wisdom. Well, if you give your heart to the Lord, then you will know God's blessing upon your natural life, your no health, your no wealth, your no prosperity. These things are peddled in many ways today. But it's not the preaching of Paul. He says, I will not speak with enticing words of men's wisdom. Those things that appeal to the natural mind, the natural wisdom of this world. And then there are those that preach an emotional gospel. 
Well, if you become a Christian, you'll have ecstatic experiences. And you'll have all sorts of adventures in your emotions. Paul doesn't preach like that. He says, I determined to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. The third characteristic of Paul's preaching is that he is a man or a preacher that relies on the power of the Spirit and not on his own powers of persuasion. He will say in verse 4, my speech and my preaching was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. We'll come to that phrase in a moment. But clearly what Paul is declaring here is that as a preacher, he does not resort or rely on carnal means to gather a following. He's not going to use clever rhetoric and clever oratory when Spurgeon was converted. And you can see the wisdom of the Lord, I think, in this. Many of you will know this, that when Spurgeon was under conviction of sin, greatly burdened and troubled in his soul on a snowy morning, he went off to a place of worship. But he couldn't get very far, but he was determined to go. And so he went into a, a little Methodist chapel, I think it was, somewhere near where he was living. And the preacher couldn't get there. And so the deacon, who never pretended to pray a preach, but he occupied the pulpit, and he did little more than repeat his text. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there is none else. I think that was the text. And Virgin was converted through the simple preaching of that text. I wonder if Spurgeon, who clearly was a man regarded as the prince of preachers, whether that served to keep him in check so that he never depended upon his own natural ability to persuade and to teach and to proclaim the truth. But he remembered the Lord can even use somebody who isn't really a preacher, who preached just because he had to, he had to by virtue of the situation to save me. I think that Spurgeon would have remembered that very keenly. Well, the apostle says here, that he does not rely upon enticing words of men's wisdom, but on the power of the Spirit. It's not to say, and this verse is not saying, that Paul never used reason and persuasion and testimony in the space of two verses. In Acts chapter 18, we read that when Paul came to Corinth, he reasoned in the synagogue. He persuaded the Jews. He was pressed in the spirit. He was urgent, testifying that Jesus is the Christ. He used all those, uh, those things, but he did so with spiritual argument, with biblical argument, with honest logic. Nothing more than that. But he didn't even rely upon those arguments that he was able to present when he demonstrated that the Old Testament foretold Christ, when he proved that the resurrection was the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises, when he could convey the message of the gospel, and it's not illogical, the gospel, is it? It does appeal to our powers of understanding, but despite all that, Paul says he depended here upon the Spirit of God for power. That's the sense, really, of this phrase at the end of verse 4. My preaching was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Well, what does this phrase mean then? He would declare the testimony of God, verse 1. He would simply proclaim what God has said, what God has revealed in his word. But he will depend upon the power of the Spirit of God 
to convict his hearers, to constrain them to abandon their sin and fall upon Christ. He will depend upon that spirit to convert them, to change their very heart and mind and attitude and will and desires that they may call upon the Lord. If you ever get the opportunity to read Jonathan Edwards' sermon, famous, the most famous sermon Jonathan Edwards ever preached, because the Lord used it in the conversion of many souls. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But if you read that sermon, you will be surprised in some ways how ordinary it is. I'm not being disparaging in any way. But you would read it and you wouldn't realize that this was a sermon that was unique for its potent arguments, for its clever rhetoric. In fact, Jonathan Edwards used to read most of his sermons. So he wasn't the most engaging orator. And yet the Lord used that sermon for the salvation of many, many souls. They were drawn not by his powers of rhetoric, but by the Spirit of God, who used that particular occasion to touch the hearts of many, many people. And that remind, that's what Paul is saying here. My dependence, my reliance was not upon enticing words, but upon the Spirit of God and of power. What does this word demonstration mean? Well, it means to prove. It's a word that would be used in a law court by a prosecutor who would demonstrate and uh, uh, bring evidence that something was true, something was genuine in someone's witness statement. And Paul is saying here, what's the proof that what I preach is from God, from heaven. Well, it's that proof in the heart of the hearers. The changed life, the conviction of sin, the converted life. That's what Paul is referring to. And he's saying, this is where, this was what my preaching was about. It wasn't about bringing people to mental or intellectual assent. No, it was bringing people to experience in their heart the convicting power of God's Word, clothed with the Holy Spirit. That's what makes a good preacher, someone who doesn't rely on themselves, but expects that the Lord, by His Spirit, will use the plain preaching of Christ and Him crucified to change lives, to bring about a real difference. Lastly, and this is really an extension of the third point. If you want to have a three-point sermon, then join these last two together. What was the aim of Paul's preaching? What's the aim of a good preacher? Well, verse 5 tells us that the aim is that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The aim of a good preacher is that through his preaching, hearers will be changed, not by his hours of argument, but by the attendance of God's Spirit, working on the mind, on the heart, the desires, the will, not through superficial decisions, but through spirit-wrought converting power, where people come to realize that they need to change, they need to repent, where people are moved by the very understanding they are given of the glories and the sufficiency of Christ, turn to him in faith and love. Do we then preach with such confidence? Do we as a church pray for the preaching with that confidence that Paul has here that we do not need a clever orator we simply need the Spirit of God to move the hearts of the hearers as Jesus Christ is faithfully and accurately 
simply step forth as the all-sufficient Savior. There are many today who coin catchphrases, who employ sound bites, and they create a following. They use strobe auditoriums, philosophical arguments. They are engaging speakers. You can listen to them easily. But are they preachers whom the Spirit of God uses? Many perhaps follow them thinking that they are Christians and they eulogize about the power of their particular preacher. There were some like that, it would seem, at Corinth. But Paul says, that was not my policy. When I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I came declaring unto you testimony of God. That's what we must pray for, that our preachers, and those whom the Lord raises up will be preachers of, the, of this stock, in this mould, who rest not in their own ability, but in dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless his words to us this evening. Our concluding hymn is 283, 283.